Good evening, everybody. Son? Give us one more minute. Okay. Okay. One more minute. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Um, I'm uh, Margaret Tierney, and I'm on the session here. Um, and I want to just tell you a few things about GCPC. Um, but I want to welcome the panelists and everyone here tonight. Um, I want to start by reading a land acknowledgment. And this land acknowledgment can be found on the Grace Covenant website. The land that the church is on today on Merriman Avenue was land along a main thoroughfare of trade and travel for the people we know the Cherokee, as the Cherokee. Merriman Avenue and Broadway Lexington Avenue were both trails the indigenous communities created and used. Not far from where the church sits, at the top of the hill between Merriman Avenue and Lexington is an ancient Cherokee gravesite. The Cherokee didn't believe in owning land much different than the views of the European colonizers who took it from them and brought the concept of ownership of land. This church sits in the city of Asheville, named in 1797 after NC Governor Samuel Ash, who never lived here, but who enslaved many people to accumulate his wealth and social and political capital in this state. 
Merriman Avenue is the name of a man who not only enslaved people to generate profit that they did not share in and that they were held excuse me, captive to secure for his heirs and not for their heirs, but his life's work was to defend and shore up the institution of slavery in order to protect the economic interests of white people. Augustus Summerfield Merriman, 1830 to 1892, U.S. Senator and Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court wrote, slavery has certainly existed from the earliest times down to the present, and it would seem that it is, in one sense, of divine appointment. By the 1850s, this land was taken and claimed by a white slave owner, John B. Whiteside, who was an organizing member of the First Presbyterian Church in Asheville. When the Presbytery purchased the land in the 1950s, our newly formed Grace Covenant Church benefited from the unjust economic benefits for white neighborhoods created by redlining. As we gather for worship today and for this evening's discussion, let us remember the history of this land and remember that Grace Covenant is committed to the doctrine of discovery that authorized the genocide of, I'm sorry, yeah, there, I'm sorry, the repudiation at the very heart of what, of the doctrine of discovery that authorized the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of black people for the economic gain of those in power. And we acknowledge and repudiate all the ways that Christianity was appropriated as a way to authorize the violence. This community of faith will not tire in our commitment to healing those deep wounds. We acknowledge our complicated and painful history on this land and as Christians in a denomination deeply formed by whiteness. So at GCPC, we are dedicated and we're committed to dismantling white supremacy in our church, in our community, in our bodies, and in our relationships. Our mission statement is theological curiosity, moral courage, abundant compassion, and beloved community. So I'd like to just ground us as we get started, as we do the next part. Um, and I'd just like to say, let's have a moment of breathing, breathing in. That's a lot that we just heard. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. God of all of us, open our hearts, open our minds. Amen. So I'd like to say, um, please feel free to bring food and drink in here if you need to use the facilities. There's a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom on this floor. Um, there's a gentle neutral bathroom upstairs. Um, and feel free to move around in any, any place you want to stand, move your body in a way that makes sense for you. So I'd like to invite Liz Huseman. I'm Liz Huseman, a member here at Grace Covenant for a while. On behalf of PART, the Power and Race team, I welcome you tonight. This is the third event in our summer racial series, the work of mutual liberation in the life of faith. Videos of the first two presentations are on the YouTube channel, and we have here tonight uh, Priscilla Robinson. Uh, Priscilla, you want to raise your hand? Um, who was our speaker um, last week and talked about the effects of urban renewal. So thank you for being here tonight. And also uh, our pastor, uh, Marsha Mount Shoup, along with Tammy Fort Logan. 
uh, did uh, the first presentation, and again, very powerful. So I hope you take a moment and uh, look at those. PART was established seven years ago, and as Margaret said, um, you know, as to address the deep roots of white supremacy in our community, our relationships, and in our bodies. We are an open, collaborative, generative, and transformative space. And I welcome any of you to this space uh, when we meet for part. I now want to welcome Libby Kyles, who will give us the gift of music. Because if you've been at church for the last four Sundays in June, and if you've been at the first two series, events in this series, you know this song, don't you? Yeah. Right? So I'm going to invite those of you who know this song already. You ain't got to wait for me to start to get up out your seat. Go ahead and rise. <laughs> Go ahead and rise. Yes, honey, yes. But we who believe in freedom cannot rest. That's right, clap your hands. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Come on now. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. important as a killing of white men, a white mother's son. Because we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Not needing to clutch for power, not needing just to shine on me. I need to be just one in the number as we stand against tyranny. To me, young people come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I can just shine the light on as they carry us through the gale. Cause we who Freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman and I speak with a voice, and I must be heard. At times I can be quite difficult. And I won't bow to no man's word. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Come on now. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Good evening. Welcome to Grace Covenant again. I am Marsha Mount Shoup. I'm the pastor head of staff here, and I'm very glad to see you all here and welcome our esteemed panelists. This panel includes four people 
deeply engaged in the reparations process in Asheville and Buncombe County. And it is on, an honor to have each one of you here tonight. And to have the opportunity to witness their conversation, their collaboration. They don't always get to sit down together and talk about this in community. So we're grateful this is sacred space. This is sacred time. We're grateful for the opportunity to witness this historic collaboration. For each of these panelists, we could share a lengthy listing of all of their amazing work and contributions to community so that we can focus on hearing from them instead of about them we have worked very hard <laughs> to whittle down to some high points to uh, some glimpses of some of their magnificence and some of the wonderful things that they have done and are doing in community so we're going to begin with an introduction of Dr. Mullen. Thank you, Marcia. Good evening. I'm John Ledgerton, a member of Grace Covenant. I'm also a longtime friend and neighbor of Dwight, Dr. Dwight Mullen, who's right here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Dwight Mullen is a native of the Watts Compton neighborhood of Los Angeles in an Asheville resident since the mid-1980s. He's co-chair of the City of Asheville's Reparation Commission and Professor Emeritus of Political Science at UNC Asheville. For almost 40 years, Dr. Dwight Mullen and his wife, Dr. Dolly Mullen, have led their students at UNCA and our community in learning about the injustice of black Ashevillians the injustices that black Ashevillians have endured in every sector of our society. One of those is the state of black Asheville reports, which began in 2007. Dwight, welcome to Grace Covenant. Dewana Little. Oh yes, let's clap. We have time for that. Gratitude. Dewana Little is co-chair of the Reparations Commission along with Dr. Mullen. Dewana is an Asheville native, a community activist, the founder of Positive Change Youth Ministries, an organization that empowers youth by centering the values of respect, love, faith, service beyond self, truthfulness, and accountability. Dewana also is the former director of YMI Cultural Center, whose mission is to promote cultural preservation and elevate black excellence through community engagement, advocacy, leadership development, and economic justice. Dewana, we are so honored to have you here tonight. Hi, I'm Kathy Meacham, and I'm also a member of Grace Covenant and a neighbor and friend of Dwight and Dolly. And, but my, I am delighted to introduce first Rob Thomas, an Asheville native who is the executive director of the Racial Justice Coalition here. A leader in the community has spoken about having lived through many of the experiences that the Racial Justice Coalition and the Reparations Commission are seeking to improve regarding racism and law enforcement. Mr. Thomas is a strong voice for restorative justice. Welcome back to Grace Covenant, Rob. We're glad to have you. And uh, Ms. Tori Garrison uh, is um, the Reparations Project Director uh, of the Reparations Stakeholder Authority of Asheville. With support from the Zedek Social Justice Fund, this dynamic leader, also an Asheville native, whose work has included writing, radio hosting, consulting for mental health, organizing, serving on many boards, working with various government agencies, this, age, uh, this 
organization will help manage the distribution of monetary reparations to local black citizens in response to community input. Welcome to Grace Covenant, Tori. And finally, someone who is a dear friend of this congregation and this community, Reverend Tammy Forte Logan, the Equity Missioner of Faith for Justice Asheville, a collective dedicated to provoking justice for and with black and brown bodied people. Reverend Forte Logan is a womanist, preacher, Christian educator, popular educator, community organizer, and cultural organizer. She's also serving the Union Hill AME Zion Church. Tammy, we are grateful to have you here tonight to facilitate this panel. Let's give her a hand. And before I hand this over to Tammy, a word about how questions will be curated tonight. We won't be passing the mic around the room. We invite you to, and somebody has already done this, which is truly amazing. There are cards in the back. You can write your questions and give them to me, Amy Kim, raise your hand. We'll be looking around, just raise your card, we're happy to come get it, and we will get those questions um, up here to the panel. We'll curate some of them if we have duplicate questions. We also have an online audience tonight. If you are online, you can put questions in the YouTube chat, or you can also email them to us at prayer at gcpcusa.org. Welcome, panelists. We're ready to go. Can everyone see me and hear me? Okay, good. I'm going to sit for a while. I've had a long day. So, I'm happy to be here. And every time I hear the term reparations, I, I see different body responses to that. And there's multiple definitions that people uh, throw around and depending on how you understand it often determines how you respond to it, right? Um, or how you resist it. So I would like to hear from um, the panelists first, what does reparations look like to you? Because I know there's multiple definitions that are used all over the, the country, right? But what does it look like? How, does, how do we know we have it? Okay. Anybody want to go first? You can just grab a mic and, and respond to that. What does it look like? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an approach that's more appropriate for I think this. Put it up. It's also, it's also me projecting, is that my my approach has been more geared towards the audience to whom I'm speaking, as opposed to having an academic, objectified, operationalized definition. And so for this audience, I'd like to offer you this idea of reparations, is that think of the, in the Old Testament. Um, there's called the year of Jubilee. And it's, it's, it's after atonement. And what happens is that the enslaved population is freed. The debts are given up. The, those people who were once at the bottom are no longer at the bottom. They're considered to be equals within the society. For a con congregation to not understand reparations tells me that you don't understand your own spiritual Heritage. So, how about that for an opener? <laughs> Anybody want to? I mean, how do you? How good? <laughs> well, we, we, should, we shouldn't have let Dr. Mullen go first. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> When I talk about reparations, I think a lot of times, especially with my non-black counterparts, I feel like a lot of times the idea is that it's just money thrown. 
Um, and it's, it's this idea of, oh, we're just gonna give money to these black people. And for me, it's more than that. Um, it, it's, it's really allowing the money to work for us in the same way that it's worked for white folks for since America has been America, right? And so it's the understanding that I also want the access. Um, and so I think equity, like true equity, is a part of that reparations process and understanding that it doesn't take anything from you. It just makes me um, have equal access to the same things that you were born with simply because of the way you look. All right. Um, I, th I think for me, like it, 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 when you ask what does reparations look like, I think that that reparations for each specific harm is going to look differently. And so, um, I'm trying to think like, how do I sum all of that up in in, in one visual? I don't know. Uh, so for me, it would look like we have hope. Because what I see right now, like most black people um, and people that this legislation is built for, like there isn't hope, there isn't even hope that this will go through. Um, and it hasn't went through yet. It ha we don't have any um, you know, tangible decrease in disparities and things of that nature. We do have more hope building, conversations happening and minds changing. But for me, it would, be, it would, it would look like hope, like people can actually see a light at the end of the tunnel, things are being corrected and addressed, and it's like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Instead of this false narrative of progress when everything has been regressive since we've ever started measuring it. Um, I'll leave it at that. Reparations to me looks like, first and foremost, something that we um, put up to the city and county around the cessation because it's hard to see the end of reparations when things are still happening, systems are still in place. It's, it's more than a, a program. It's more than access. It's an institutional and constitutional shift because it, without the policy, like reparations to me is that shift in policy that ceases the harm that has been perpetuated on black people for generations. And so until that happens, we could create all the programs, we could throw all the money at it, but as long as the harms are continuing and there's a structure that upholds the harm to black people, we will still be having this conversation around reparations for generations to come. So to me, it's the, the real shift and constitution and in all of our policies and legislation and all of the things because the things that cease to exist will also open up the doors of opportunities for black people who have been marginalized for since we came to this country Amen. <laughs> thank you so that was actually going to be my, my next question. No, no, no. It's perfect. It's a perfect segue because uh, I was actually asked this morning about cessation of harm, right? And uh, I think people, particularly faith, people of faith, need to understand what the harm is, right? Because most people think of reparations of repairing something of the past. And one of the first um, challenges that I heard the Reparation Commission pose was stop, right? The harm that you're still doing. Can you help people understand the harm that is still happening, right? And why it was necessary to name that? Because people don't understand that. They think we're just talking about what happened uh, in American chattel slavery, right? Years ago, they don't understand what's happening now. So anybody want to respond to that? Yes. <laughs> um, it's the economic disparities. Like one thing is, black people are still being marginalized out of the financial access to loans and things to be able to get into homes and start businesses and have access to the finances that they need, even in employment, to being paid. It's also healthcare. Look at the healthcare disparities by race. 
Look at the criminal justice system by race. Look at the education system by race. Mm -hmm. Like our children are being set back from inception. They're being targeted from the time they're born until they are, until they first interaction with the criminal justice system. That's something that is happening right now. So how do we stop those things? Like the criminal justice, we have people that have been incarcerated and a good percentage of white people who have committed the same charges, the same crime, are free. They got probation while black bodies are locked up and imprisoned. Like the reality is it's still happening. We look 2020, let's look as recent as, matter of fact, last year, like the police shooting black bodies. They did a study in, in um, Florida and they said one, one in every two, two black people would be shot in the back by a police officer. My son wanted to go there to vacation. I was like, nah, we're going up north. You know what I mean? So, like, like, you know what I'm saying? Not to say that it's better, but the statistics don't lie. The data don't lie. And if the disparities are steadily increasing, how do we stop that so that we can start decreasing it? Like, we working on it's beautiful organizations all over this city that's doing amazing work to try to address the the issues, the disparities. That's a big grant writing opportunity to address the disparities. But you can't address, you're really not making headway on the disparities because it keeps increasing because the harm doesn't stop. So as long as we fix, like we fix one issue, then it's another person coming with the same issue because now they've been harmed. Then we fix that, it, like it just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. You can't attack the disparities and decrease any of the marginalizations or disparities that's happened across all categories. Like it's not one, it's every last one of them. That's why our focus areas are what they are for the Reparations Commission because we had to address all of it. You can't just fix education without fixing housing, without fixing economic development, without, you know what I mean? Like you have to address it all mm -hmm. in order to really see it successful. So that's the right now we're talking about, the harms that are happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wanna to respond to that? Especially bringing it more, um, bringing it home, right, to Asheville, um, in, like specific things that you might be or thinking about, because um, Devonna kind of gave us a bigger picture and things that are happening in Asheville, but just, it's just hard, it's been my experience, it's hard for people to see, it. To see mm. right, and uh, to comprehend in Asheville what it looks like. Um, so the harm looks like de facto segregation, which you see right now, right? Like, uh, the harm looks like driving through uh, uh, what used to be a bustling black business corridor and you know only a, a couple of black businesses and mostly white establishments now. The harm is youth in school um, with no mentors to look up to, especially black men, because uh, opportunities have been snatched away from whole communities of people and from households uh, not from one single systemic area, but from like multiple categories at the same time. Um, what the harm looks like is uh, you all not knowing what, you know, uh, what it's like to be a black person or be, uh, or how abrasive it can be coming closer to black people. Um, the harm is not knowing, you know, not only our history, but your own true history to understand some of your own generational traumas uh, that has been passed on through your own DNA that play out in current day society and nobody really knows how to understand it because disconnected from the history. Mm -hmm. um, what it looks like, what the harm looks like is not being able to solve problems and community issues because you're not even looking at the cause of it. Um, what the harm looks like is uh, <laughs> homeless people, what the harm looks like is gang members in the street because we are finding community and family amongst ourselves because society has cut us out. 
Um, what the harm looks like is, you know, uh, an individual snubbed out by law enforcement or another person the same color as, as him or, or, or her or them uh, because somebody outside of the box shook the box. And, um, you know, what it looks like is what we see on the news uh, when we see gun violence in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what the harm looks like is our children our black children not wanting to participate in school because we don't see any part of ourselves in it, not even in the staff. What, what the harm looks like is, you know, a whole society of people uh, criminalized because they are, um, you know, their quality of life is lesser than others and they don't have the same opportunities. It's been shown and proven that place any community in, in poverty and, and crime uh, gets exacerbated. But what it looks like is us being called lazy. What it looks like is us being called criminals. What it looks like is us being called uh, angry. angry. Yeah, I'm <laughs> called that all the time. Um, and several As if other things. you don't have a reason to be angry. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? I can keep going. I will leave it at that. But this is what I see every day in reality. Like, I see the harm. I'm walking through it. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the harm looks like a bunch of people living in public housing whose families three and four generations ago owned property, um, and then so much more. Mm -hmm. And, and, and <clears throat> of course, we can put numbers to all that. Mm -hmm. The data is based. This, this is all based on data. Um, the end of, and you want to know what the harm looks like in education, you look at the end of course exams, you look at the end of grade exams given by actual city schools and Bunton County schools. And what you're finding is that over the years, and it's not because of the pandemic, is that the gap between black and white student performances are statistically can't get any wider. Whether it's in reading, whether it's in subject material, whether it's in, 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 in math, mathematical skills. It, it statistically, you start violating individual rights of privacy because we can identify by looking at the black students that 90% of you are not on grade level. Right? You can pick a grade. For healthcare, you look at the mortality rates and morbidity rates that face us. The top 10 killers for black people are not the same top 10 killers for white people. You're looking at the mortality rates of diseases where once they are diagnosed, black women still dying at a higher rate because of the, the access to effective medical care. We're looking at the absence of black health care workers. If you want to see it in housing, look at gentrification. Look at black neighborhoods that are, not, that are now white neighborhoods. Look at who the financial institutions give the mortgages to. Look at the absence of law enforcement when it comes to discriminatory behavior by institutions. We can go on. <laughs> the data support it. And if you're wondering if it's just the data for Asheville, I can point you to data that started 1898 by Du Bois looking at Philadelphia. This is a systemic institutional issue. Anyway. Just, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We should, Would you like to respond? Is there another mic down there? Oh, there mm -hmm. is. Um, well, all of you have named everything that I had in my head, but um, to make it even more personal, I would say the harm looks like the fact that we have to have continuous conversations about why we deserve reparations. Um, I, think the, I think the fact that we're still in a space in 2023 where when we say racism, um, typically white people will put, um, clutch their pearls, you know, like, oh my gosh, what, what do you mean? It doesn't exist. The harm is the fact that every time we talk about race, I have to be the one to explain it. Um, I, I was in a training a few weeks, maybe more than a few weeks ago, they're all starting to be a blur. But um, one of the things, it, it was very interesting because this was a, a, a training about uh, racial equity. And if she's in here, I apologize ahead of time. But there was a um, there was a white lady who said, "Well, how do I get um, people on board to think that we should be talking about racism and that we should be dismantling racism?" That's the harm. That's the fact that we're even in this space together, and I have to explain to you why my black body 
<laughs> shouldn't be policed, why my black body um, has to explain why, why I exist, that's the harm. The harm is the fact that every time we bring up certain situations, you get uncomfortable because you feel like you have to look internally and, and call out. Even if you're not actively doing it, you're reaping the benefits of it. Um, the harm is the fact that you sit around other people. Yes, you may be the person that's like, I'm dismantling this, but when you go home and you sit around amongst your parents or your kids or your cousins, um, are you calling them out? Or are you expecting us? That's the harm. The harm is the fact that my seven-year-old child on last Monday um, was told by a six-year-old white boy that he didn't play with black kids because of the color of their skin. And the harm is the fact that he learned that at home. So the harm doesn't even have to go outside of you. The harm is really every time you're uncomfortable and you're sitting there and you're like, oh, another one of those conversations, that's the harm. That's the harm. Amen. That's right. Yes. So I hope that was pretty clear. <laughs> as to why that request was made. Uh, now, I would like to hear from you all, given the fact that the Reparations Commission has made that request, I would like to know what has the response been from the city of Asheville and Buncombe County? Uh, response to what question? Cessation of harm, like that request. You asked that as a commission that was the first thing, right, on the docket. Like, let's stop first. Let's stop doing these things. So what was the response? The, the, the city and the county both accepted. Um, what, the, what the Reparations Commission can do is make recommendations. We can't effectively put in place and implement the policies. We then, we, we, we formed the recommendations. In this case, it was called Stop the Harm. It was a one-pager that basically said, are we even obeying the law? Our, our, our public areas of responsibility, ranging from education and healthcare and housing, economic development and criminal justice, are they even abiding by their own decrees, judicial decisions, regulations, laws passed by Congress, by the state, or by the city and county? And that's what we asked for, a, an audit of government itself. Mm -hmm. And the response was to agree with that and to go through the administrative process, what we think of as bureaucracy, but go through the administrative process of finding a, a company to do the research to determine whether or not harms are still occurring. Okay. Um, they selected, I believe last week, the winner of the competition for the contract to conduct the research, but the research itself has not started and the results probably will not come in until uh, sometime in the fall. Okay, so they hired a consultant. Uh, yeah, this is a research firm. Research firm mm -hmm. to audit the existing harms yes. in those areas yeah. uh, related to their own practice or, mm. or policies and practices. And results are expected in the fall. Yeah, and one of the rationales that, one, one, one of the rationales is that why would we expect the perpetrators of the disparities to report accurately on themselves. Right. And so a third party was, was hired. Right. Another was that if we find that disparities determined by a third party continue to happen, what then are your responses? And that was not built into mm -hmm. the recommendation other than in the form of a report back to the commission. Mm -hmm. um, the city and county have, did not obligate themselves to actually end it because they know that it can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you end, when you look at education, for example, and you see for the last 30 years that there have been disparities in outcomes assessments, regardless of where those outcomes assessments are coming from, but end of grade and end of course exam mm -hmm. results are disparate by race in every year you choose to look at, how do you say to yourself, I'm going to end that, without committing yourself to a process that doesn't even exist yet, holding teachers accountable? That doesn't even exist. How do you how do you hold yourself accountable to to equal justice by looking at APD and Pullman County sheriffs when we know statistically 
and this audit firm will hopefully officially say this, that he's four times as likely to be arrested, to be stopped, cited, um, um, rest, and arrested if you were a black male as opposed to a white female. Mm -hmm. And that's been the case for at least the last 10 years. And so at, at committing yourself to immediate stoppage of harm, if you look at the process, that was not a part of the commitment by the city or by the county. So, so is the goal to, of the audit <sighs> to validate that the harm is there, or is it to I, I, stop I, it? Yeah, Reverend, I, you know, part of it is that much of this was based on individual reports done by public policy areas, and they did voluntarily, mm -hmm. or by citizen watch groups, for example, in education, they were report. Um, 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 but much of it was based on student papers that I was a part, I was privy to advising through the state of Black Asheville. Mm -hmm. And these student papers were undergraduate research projects. They found out this data and generated it for 10 years without a single response from city or county government. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those things that takes student research, undergraduate research, to another level. and okay. makes it official. So this is kind of phase two, right? They already got some data, mm. but now they want to quantify with more data mm. to establish what the issues really are. Um, <clears throat> but also, um, with our Reparations Commission, we have been asking for data for the different IFA focus groups across the categories and it just seemed to be a challenge to get it especially segregated by race it was data that was not a lot non-existent by race mm -hmm. and so it's like okay so y'all don't got <laughs> y'all don't got what we need to make the recommendations to implement the changes that need you know the recommendations for the changes that we have identified so this is another way to get that information. And if it's not there, it be created in this process. So our reparations commission, there are several members that are a part of it, has been a part of the, high, the RFP process. From developing it, the RFP, we have vetted it as a commission as well, um, to actually going through the interviews and reviewing the proposals and the whole step of the way. So this is not, we ask the city and county to do something and we expect them to do the same thing. This is, oh, we here, we go hold your hand, make sure we get it where we want it. You know what I mean? So it's not, it is a different process, but in order for us to be able to address the issues, we have to have the data that supports it for legal standing for it to be successfully implemented. So there won't be question. So they will, we will have the data that says, this is the data that supports it from the audit that was done on the city and county that supports these recommendations because that's a big part of it, the legal aspect of our recommendations being fully implemented. Okay. Anyone else want to respond to that before I ask a follow-up question? Well, I would say what, what's coming up for me as you're, you're naming uh, kind of the process that the city has begun um, in an attending a reparations commission meeting and watching that, that play out. Uh, and I, I shared this the other week. I think it's Audre Lorde who said that the master's house cannot be dismantled by the master's tools. Is that right? So, um, as I observe your process, and we also got some questions around this last week, I guess the question for me is, how does the entity that has done the harm now be held accountable to stopping the harm? when the structure in which you're utilizing, right, is under the control of the city. How does that happen? So that is a question as members of Reparations Commission as well. Because okay. like one thing is we recognize, oh, sorry y'all. Did y'all hear anything I said? Okay. One thing we recognize is that 
there is a lot of bureaucracy in getting anything done with mm -hmm. in which the commission needs to do like as simple as community engagement it's all these rules around how we can do that you know what i mean so um we also we recognize that and it's like do we walk away from this table or do we work with other organizations that are doing similar work to help to bypass the ropes that we are currently in as we look for another way of doing this process. Like this process has a timeline. This, this wasn't meant to be forever. This, it really has a, a timeline. And so with that being said, how do we implement this? And every IFA, IFA group with their recommendations are always tying in the accountability process of how to keep this moving and holding city county whoever like we're looking at the like mission is not a part of the city or county like we're looking at all the aspects how do we build community a community focus or work with another organization that's doing that does not have the strengths that we have given to, attached to the process and so we're always challenging ourselves to work with other look for other opportunities to engage in a different way with the conversation because a lot of things are outside of a lot of recommendations are outside of the city and county they have a little a limited scope when you think about reparations and actually recommendations that re, that stop the harm or remediate recommendation or remediate the issue and so with that being said we looking across the spectrum you know we are under the city and county and we try to change up how we do it, but at the same time, it, it's limiting. Just to be honest, it's limiting. We make recommendations, not implement. And they have the option to say no. And so we are always looking at a different way to do this work in a way that is less restricted. Mm -hmm. And instead of creating a will, how do we work with organizations that don't have those limitations so that we can still push this thing forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I was gonna ask you, as the Reparation Stakeholder Authority of Asheville is outside of the city and Buncombe County, and I know some of the visioning around that was that uh, you would have more control, right, of dollars that would come forward for reparation or support resources, that type of thing. Um, that the city would not control or the county would not control and so how you imagine that um, because I don't I don't think people in the room know much about the reparation stakeholder authority of Asheville and its role so if you want to say a little bit about that yeah so the vision is um, not only to be the holder of money um, as it relates to reparations and allowing black, uh, black citizens, black residents of Asheville and Buckham County to determine how that reparations is spent. So it's, it's not just that, it's also being that organization that can hold the city and county um, accountable. It's also being the knowledge source, right, to be able to educate on what is changing, what, what rules are being implemented, um, what policies are being passed, city, city um, county, and state government that maybe we don't know, right? Um, you don't know what you don't know. And one of the things they always say, if you don't want black people to know it, put it in a book. So we wanna make sure <laughs> I mean, that, that really is, you know, that, that really has been the thing, right? And so we want to make sure that they know, we know. We want to make sure that we're not afraid to hold the city and county of, um, accountable. We're not afraid to look at those recommendations and question why can't you implement those recommendations, right? Um, and understanding that because it is a city and county entity, um, this commission, they should be able to guide to say, okay, if you're having a recommendation that is completely out of the scope, let me educate you on why it's out of the scope so that you can give me something within the scope, right? RSAA, on the other hand, can, can really be the convener and the, the entity that says, even if they deem it outside the scope, we can find a different way to do it, right? Um, but one of the things also that I want to make sure people understand, those people who, 
Now, when I say this, I am not speaking for RSA. Let me go ahead and just say that first. But understanding that those people that sit on city council and sit on the county commissioner, those people are temporary. Their, their position is not permanent. And so when they're not doing what they're saying they're supposed to be doing, we have the power to either make them do it or send them home. And, and it's, 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 it really is. Like we have the power to start going to these places and, and, and holding them accountable, questioning them. Um, and a lot of times, even going back to the first question, I feel like this, again, being from Asheville, I think a lot of times they do just enough Right, they, you know, we, we get in an uproar, they do just enough. You know, they dangle it just enough where you feel like, okay, they satisfied the taste and then they're like, okay, they'll forget about it because they know the commission is ending. It's, it's on the time crunch, right? And so my question is, once, once it's ended, then will they say, okay, you know what, well, they're still working. Because we know the city has a habit of saying, no, it's, it's still being done. It's, it's um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna have it um, announced at this next meeting, and then for whatever reason it doesn't make it on, we run out of time, right? So, I think it takes us and y'all, right, to really hold the city accountable, but again, as it relates to RSAA, we have the power to really hold that accountability and really make sure that black people understand what is happening in the area that we live and also understanding that they can have the power um, to determine how reparations want to be spent. Whether it is giving it to um, our, our seniors so they can go to college, you know, whether it is uh, giving it to people to go to um, trade school, whether it is going and deciding how to um, make sure that we're able to keep our properties or get our properties back, right? Whatever it is that black citizens decide they want to do, we're going to do, you know, the, the goal is to be able to do it within RSAA. And it's not being controlled by city or government or any other entity like that. Um, <clears throat> one other point or, or perspective I like to get out there as well is, is looking at what we're building as a reparations ecosystem and not just a standalone commission, not just a standalone RSAA, um, not just standalone community groups that are working towards it or organizations, but we're trying to build out an ecosystem that still has piece, piece, pieces that need to be filled in, such as a healing component uh, with uh, truth telling. Um, at a very deep level, I feel like if we'd have done the decades of truth telling that should have happened um, before this, we wouldn't be at the point we're at right now where we're trying to argue that uh, reparations is justice and not charity. Um, so again, just the whole concept of, of building out an ecosystem to, uh, to address this situation and also um, how all the movement work is fueling each other. So we may be a municipal government, but this is still creating political capital for a state-led movement and federal initiatives. Another thing I would like to guide people into, you know, Racial Justice Coalition, we have a table out there with a pledge and um, that we have, uh, and, and also asking for support for uh, President Biden to sign an executive order supporting HR 40, because right now that's about our, our most um, <laughs> logical solution with our, with, you know, with the current makeup of our Congress and the bureaucracy that they can send legislation through. Um, but yeah, just think of it as it's all connected and some of the, I would say some of the results are, are, are qualitative in the beginning. You know, like the conversations that we're having, this happening tonight. Yeah, I'm disappointed at where we're at as a society, but uh, things are moving. Like, there are so many communities that are moving forward with reparations. There are so many states, um, you know, even overseas, the conversation is, is very much alive. And just remember that everybody's watching us. Us and Evanston are the two leading cities when it comes to reparations and how far we've gotten into the process. Um, this is a new process. And, um, you know, I'm still disappointed in where we're at because, you know, we've been proximate enough to know where we could be. 
Um, so a lot of people that don't know what we could be can look at where we're at and be like, oh, yes, it's so great. And that's what happens everywhere else. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to put that thought out there that we're building an ecosystem and not standalone entities. And the RSAA is not in competition with, with uh, the city's community reparations commission. They definitely energize each other. Or with RJC, we all work together. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the way it has to happen, right? So there are several questions. And um, one of the first things I just want to want to ask, uh, connected to what you were saying about the consulting group, the, the research firm, do we know the racial makeup of that group, the one that was that won the competition. <laughs> I'm curious about the competition part, but no, you don't have that data. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we know finding demographic data has been a challenge uh, in the city of Asheville and Buncombe County for a while. Uh, and thinking about the echo ecosystem that you name, Rob, are there local businesses that have <laughs> surfaced? to be a part of that ecosystem? Um, are there larger corporate businesses, maybe beyond Asheville, that are part of the ecosystem and being a part of the reparations movement? Sorry. So yes, there, there actually are. There, there are you know, a lot of billion dollar entities uh, in this reparation movement work. For instance, um, Lush that makes body products, amazing body products, um, they're in this work and working with organizations nationally um, to move reparations forward. You also have uh, Ben and Jerry's who has, you know, kind of came out for years uh, publicly supporting things such as Juneteenth and, and now uh, more recently reparations. And for the most part, I, f I feel like uh, when you talk about businesses and entities, a lot of it is, is privately funded, whereas you have a lot of entities with it being such a, a you know, a, a controversial word, you know, them being afraid to engage with it. I will also add that there is a coalition, well not call it, an organization, I can't remember the name of them, but they specifically go to um, organizations like Ben and Jerry's and Lush and uh, have that conversation to get them involved with reparations. Like I said, there's so many different things going on at one time pertaining to uh, this movement that, that is reparations. Okay. So another question about the research firm. I know that's a recent process, but did that come from the city or the county's budget? Do we know? It's coming from <clears throat> the, 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 the financing for the research firm is coming out of the reparations fund. Um, and right now we're at that $4.2 million um, with half being given by the city and half of it being given by the county mm -hmm. with a commitment of $500,000 again from the city and $500,000 from the county mm -hmm. uh, for until they change their minds. And so that, 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 that process- Oh, we change their minds. You know, to, but, yeah. We change their minds. Mm -hmm. But that, that the money for that research is coming out of it. But if I can go back to mm -hmm. Rob's point on ecosystems. This is a developing process. This is, we've not been in this ground before. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I take responsibility for it. This new part of the ecosystem that um, um, just came together. Um, and it was, it's, it's, a, it's called the tuition reparations pilot. And this is a small little group that came out of the state of Black Asheville. We were rebuilding the site. I had some students working. And as we talked, we found out these students are in, are in debt for going to school. These are Asheville City, Buncombe County Schools uh, graduates. And we said, why can't we use our limited money this summer to resolve the debt that they're facing as they go to the to university in the fall? Mm -hmm. And so we're asking people to use this new aspect of the ecosystem called personal reparations. And we're looking at it from the standpoint of people in the community who have personally benefited from enslavement or from the, the processes that were involved with segregation or who were on the wrong side of the institution that produced the disparities that we're discussing and enriched themselves. Their families were enriched. This is an opportunity to personally make amends at a local level 
only in education. If it succeeds, we can easily expand this to healthcare, to housing, and to criminal justice, et cetera. But the level of personal commitment to reparations doesn't have to wait until the institution evolves the ecosystem that can house it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so, so. And I appreciate that for sure, for, for you naming that, because I am seeing faith communities starting to take a piece of that, right? They've been, they've been building their coffers for a while and waiting for leadership um, to see, you know, how things are going to pan out, but also recognizing there's some things we can do right now, like we don't have to wait. So that is a movement that is happening across Asheville uh, in our faith communities, and I appreciate the faith communities that are doing that. And I hope that those that aren't, uh, that you would consider ways that you can be a part of that. So you talked about the students and, and student debt, and there is a question around uh, whether or not free college tuition has been asked for or will be recommended. Uh, like, for example, AB Tech, can that be free? Uh, can, you know, for black students, I'm assuming is what they're naming. Uh, so um, our education group is looking at um, our local institutions. Mm -hmm. um, a higher education is not just limited to AB Tech. We're looking at UNCA. We're yeah. looking at all of our local institutions, even as far as Warren Wilson and Mars Hill. Like, we're looking at all of them because, like, all, all of our local institutions, we do not have HBCU locally. Right. Um, so with that being said, our youth are me, occurring. Pause oh. for a moment. Um, HBCU, historically black college university. That's what she's Sorry. saying. Okay. All right. I saw some responses. Yeah. So okay. Um, so with that being said, we're looking at like our kids are going into college. So a lot of them having to go to AB Tech, take take some extra classes to get to a college level to be able to then transfer into a four-year college and the amount of debt associated with our kids getting in the, the extensive, a lot of times, time that they're spending in acquiring a, a um, degree is a lot of debt that could be lifted if so that they can actually graduate and not have that. I'm still paying student loans. It's crazy. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? They can have access to those type of uh, resources to be able to go to college and not have to worry about that. So it's something that we are considering. We are looking at, but that's not something, a recommendation that we would have to make to the city or county. That's, a, that's a, another part of the conversation that stems outside of our recommendation our recommendations to the city and county because they really don't have the leverage to influence that. They really are not the institution that can implement that. They would have to be with the schools directly having that conversation and bringing them to the table. So that is a part of the process is looking at external organizations and institutions to bring them to the table around, rec around reparations as it, the needs of fit. Okay, so expanding that ecosystem. Yeah to other groups beyond yeah. city, county, stakeholder yeah. association, faith communities, yeah. institutions, I'm guessing hospitals, yes. banks, yes. All, all, of, all of the above. And you know, you know this, is not, this is not daydreaming, this is not brainstorming. We're, we're in education, for example, on the, on the table in front of Dogwood Health Trust, I personally place the idea of creating a HOPE scholarship for Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Where if you graduate from a school in Western North Carolina, you are guaranteed a tuition-free college experience. Mm -hmm. Whether mm -hmm. it's a community, whether it's at the four-year university, state university, this is completely doable. Mm -hmm. Completely doable. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And I think it's important, Dr. Mullen, for people to to grasp that because we live in a culture um, with a scarcity mindset that there's not enough or that somehow if you get reparations, then it's going to be taken from me and my family. And so there's a resistance to that. But the truth is there's more than enough. And the truth is some of you have way too much that you could ever spend, that you could ever use, right? Um, and there are institutions who have been built on the backs of black bodies for centuries. Um, that have built their wealth in that way. And so figuring out a way to, to be fair, to be equitable. Like, this is not a handout. So I hope people understand that. 
Um, and if not, we will, we'll be glad to talk to you a little bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's, hold on for a moment, yes. No, and I was gonna say, and there are, I know I can speak for individuals and um, organizations that I've personally had meetings with. There are um, people locally who are more than willing, ready, and have. So know that, like Dr. Mullen said, th this is not something that we just threw up and trying to see what sticks to the wall. This, this is really happening and it's moving. And a lot of times these individuals don't wanna be called and in reality, I mean, should they? But the reality of it is it's happening and it's, it's happening every day. There are people like um, who, who have, like you said, more than enough, um, more than enough money and they recognize like, how did I get this money? Did I have to work for this money? Um, where did this money come from? Who aided in me being able to have this money? Um, and want to give it towards reparations, right? And want to give it towards reparations without saying it has to be used this certain way. Um, I think a lot of times there are institutions and, and um, individuals who like to dictate how, mu how their money is spent. Um, but, but there are a lot of people out there who, who are willing and giving money and, and not in a place where they have to dictate it. And again, this is where we're gonna let black, like black Ashevillians decide what to do with it. Um, I will say even with, um, even when we talk about the, the schools and we talk about AB Tech, you know people who sit on those boards. You know people who work in those schools. And again, it doesn't always have to be us that have those conversations. This is where you get to utilize that allyship and have, start having those conversations. You know, even if it's in your neighborhood, if you live in Biltmore Forest, you know, like having those conversations with that, uh, those individuals working at the Biltmore. No people, uh, you know, I'm not even gonna get on the topic of Biltmore and the harm, but, um, Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of those conversations don't have to wait on us. They, they don't have to wait on black bodies. And even if you don't feel comfortable having those conversations, you can invite us into those spaces, um, especially spaces that you haven't seen us in yet, or those spaces where you feel like the conversations haven't quite started. We're more than willing. Uh, well, I'm, I'm speaking for everybody, but I'm sure everybody, more than willing. Yes. <laughs> So Tori, can you, before Rob, you pick up on that, can you say more about, and maybe all of you can respond to that, but particularly with the Stakeholder Association, how you're imagining um, eligibility. Like how do I uh, qualify as a recipient of reparations? That's what people are wanting to know. What right is, now, um, Again, we want this to be completely membership decided. And so the qualifications to be a member is black and in Asheville, Buncombe County. It's real simple, black, Asheville, Buncombe County. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, as we have conversations again, because the membership gets to decide how that money is disseminated, they can decide if they want to spend it on, let's say rents, how do we decide how it's being spent on rent? That's gonna be completely up to the membership. That wouldn't be something that I decide and simply because the whole goal is to, to work to dismantle those systems where it's top heavy, where we're deciding for the people. We want the people to be able to decide for themselves. Thank you. And so, do any of you have thoughts about money or, or opposed to money as, as a part of reparations or pro? money being a part of reparations, and um, is that going to be part of the recommendation to city and the county? For example, I know that Evanston, uh, I think they just distributed maybe $25,000 um, to people who met a certain criteria. Uh, I think they just released checks around that, and my understanding that their revenue came from marijuana sales, right? I'm not sure where what's happening in California, but people are imagining different ways of doing this, but there's a, seems to be this hesitancy, this resistance to talk about repair by money, right? And that it's not just that, but 
the question that I received was, is that going to be part of the recommendation? Is it me? Okay. Um, yeah, I did. So the first thing I wanted to state, this was just a brief comment, talking about conversations. You can go to rjcavl.org. We have a conversation guide for individuals and organizations. So if you work in an organization and you have, uh, you know, conversations with direct leadership, it would be great to, um, you know, get some conversations inside of your workplace or individual uh, interpersonal conversations. Uh, again, rjcavl.org, please check out the conversation guides. Um, and let's see, the, the question you asked was about money. I, th I think that, um, honestly, it, it, we can't fix the issue without money because the system that we exist in, you know, it's like we are in a monopoly game that's been going on for 400 years and you know that if you brought somebody into the game late, you're not gonna give them the three to five hundred dollars that everybody else started out with. They'd go around one time and be bankrupt and be in jail for the whole rest of the game. That is the state of black people in America. So we, we have to have the money, but there are other pieces and other things that have been done to us that are just as important to, to remedy. Um, and I don't want that to take away from the importance of the money, but I think it's a multi-faceted process to where, like again, you gotta look at the harms. And what we're trying to do is, is remedy these harms. You know, we're not looking for a paycheck because you, you know, you beat and raped, or not you, but your ancestors. Uh, we're looking to remedy the outcomes that that has created, such as the generational wealth gap. You know, we're not looking for a paycheck for the harm that you've done to us. We're looking for restitution and compensation. Compensation for labors and things that we should have got compensated for and didn't. And restitution consists of, of remedies and, and a whole bunch of other things that would uh, reverse the outcomes of said issue. Um, and I will hand it to Sure. Um, <clears throat> another, let me give you another way of thinking about it, is that we have personal injury and there's collective injury. We can identify individuals who are harmed going all the way back to enslavement. I mean, we have a, a register of deeds who has digitized those records. We know the individuals who are involved on both sides as enslaved as well as enslavers. We can look at tax records and talk about the discriminatory behaviors of private institutions as they paid or did not pay individuals. We can talk about social security. Now, many of our ancestors were eliminated from Social Security and weren't able to pay or, be, or benefit from them because of the occupations that they held as domestics or as agricultural workers. You see, the, the monetary compensation at the individual level is a doable thing. It takes work, but we can identify it. But, but don't think that individual compensation can accumulate as a total justification for reparations. We still need to talk about the collective harm that was done to the community. Mm -hmm. And again, the economic model can be, can we, we can construct that. Mm -hmm. What did we lose with the destruction of Stumptown? Mm -hmm. And what would have been gained had it never been destroyed? Mm -hmm. Those, those, those are real concepts that can be monetized. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about money, I'm, I'm nervous about qualifications based on genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm nervous about the idea of just sending a check without a system or institutions within which to invest that or protect it. And so when we talk about that, I'd rather not get to the bottom line. I still want to feel good about how the means by which we reach that bottom line, you see. Mm -hmm. You see, another way of thinking about it is this. It's, it's ridiculous for us to believe that our present state is going to be protected by the institutions that perpetuated it. That's just ridiculous. But it's also lethal to leave that state to its own devices. We can talk about incident after incident in this country's history where white institutions not only victimized but murdered black bodies. But we can't, and so our involvement with white institutions and overarching institutions of the public as well as private sector has to continue. But we have the double responsibility of creating black governed institutions with, that, are, that are financed through predictable and reliable sources. And I'm, let me give you an example. In education, I've been talking personally with Asheville City Schools, Bunk County Schools for the last 35 years. 
All it did was increase the disparities. <laughs> so maybe I should have never said nothing. <laughs> On the other hand, two years ago, we had a governing body that founded a black governed state sanctioned by the Department of Public Instruction Institution for Children. We have a K, we established a K through uh, three elementary school, charter school, the Peak Academy. And, and, and now we just expanded to the fifth grade, and mm -hmm. we have intentions to expand to the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board for that school. Mm -hmm. And you see the pricing pan? I'm chairing this commission, and I'm being on the board for a Peak Academy. I can't, that's unsustainable. It's just plain old unsustainable. And everyone up here is doing that same pricing. That cost is, is, is taking it out. Mm -hmm. This is the generation you're looking at that's going to take it over, though. But let me show you back to the Peak Academy. We are looking at holding our responsibilities to ourselves in a black government institutions and we're getting the results right now as we speak. They cannot officially be made until October. However, we're getting preliminary results that show that our third, gra our third graders, who are the first grade to receive end of grade exams, Libby, all of them are proficient. All of them are proficient. All of them. Okay, so, you know, You know, and I, I know I'm going to catch it for break, breaking that data, but the point is, is that name me a school within Asheville City of Buncombe County where the black students are proficient at the third grade. You can't do it because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so to leave white institutions by themselves is dangerous, if not lethal. To have black government institutions is a responsibility that we have to double up on and do, and the relationship between the two has to be resourced properly. That's money. <laughs> hey, as a co-founder of Peak Academy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I know this is our order, but the main reason we came together to develop Peak Academy is because we needed to not just show our state and the, you know, United States, but we need to show black people that this narrative that you've been fed about not being enough, mm -hmm. not being good enough, our children can do, that's a lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about reparations, we are also talking about giving black bodies their value back. Mm -hmm. And every time this country says, well, we can give reparations to this group and this group and give this group, but when it comes to black bodies, there's a reason why it can't happen. Mm -hmm. That's a problem and that is a harm. Absolutely. And I, and I will say also, um, my, my daughter has been going to Peak Academy since the, yeah, because it's been two years. It's the third year. Yeah, so since the beginning. Um, and even, I mean, one, being able, I have a child who goes to Reynolds, um, and then I have a child that goes to Peak. And I can tell you the, the things that both have experienced have been completely different. Um, the, the things that my son had to experience at such a young age by teachers, like I, I'm not even gonna go to the basis of students, but by the harms by teachers being told, um, I'll call the police on you for bumping into me. You know, like th these are teachers, the, the teachers that teach our kids. And then my daughter being able to go to school and be proud of her natural hair, be proud of her skin because she's been taught by people that look like her. It, it really does matter. And it, and it shows our students a different way. It shows our youth a different way. And I think sometimes it's difficult to process when it's always been your norm, right? But when it hasn't been your norm, it's something amazing that happens. I mean, we, we've seen it all the time. We talk about in movies, people wanting to see people that look like them, The Little Mermaid. I mean that alone, and look at how much fuss happened because there was a, a, a imaginary creature. Yep. That was an fun. imaginary creature shook the nation mm -hmm. simply because the skin had melanin in it, mm -hmm. right? And, and that should tell you mm -hmm. that there's a lot of work to be done. When, you, when we're fighting over imagination, like a, of a creature that doesn't exist, unless you're on TikTok and it, you go down this rabbit hole. But that doesn't <laughs> exist, that's when we know we're, at, we're having a problem. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to speak to the money thing. And, and I wanna make it very specific to Asheville and Buncombe County and understanding that 
My fear when we talk about giving, just giving money without the education is understanding, okay, do we pay taxes on that money, right? Do we still have to report that money and understanding that majority, when we're looking at statistics, majority of the black people in Ashland Buncombe County live in income-based housing. And so my fear is that by giving just a check, it eliminates them from being able to still have access to that housing. And so even that, uh, that system has to be rectified. That system has to be looked at in order for us to not be caused more harm, right? Um, so those are conversations that I think even we have to continue to have in, in our own collective as black people, but also with city and county government to say like, hey, if this, if this is something that happened, what will it look like long term for these individuals? Um, and making sure that we're, we're keeping people in their homes and also giving them better um, access to homes, right? Um, but yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? For we have one closing question, I think. We can go to the closing question. Okay. So um, I'm sorry if we couldn't get to all of your questions because there's many. Um, I will uh, encourage people if you want to know more specifics about recommendations that you um, either attend the Reparations Commission mission or the IFAs uh, that are meeting for housing, economic development, education, health, and wellness, and criminal justice. And you can know a little bit more about the specifics. Um, schedules are online on the City of Asheville's um, website and uh, those meetings are open to anybody that wants to attend if you'd like to do that. So I think the, the burning uh, question that I have and I, and I hope others have because uh, you know, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't expect you to do something, right? Um, to help with this process because I think we're part of the ecosystem as well. It's gonna take all of us to repair, to make this right. And um, so my question to our panelists is, what can people do to advocate for your work? So for example, the Reparations Commission can make recommendations. What can we do? to support those recommendations so they become reality? So, um, be present. I have sat in many city council and Buncombe County Commissioners meeting and watched as people came out by the hundreds uh, to advocate for a sidewalk or a bike lane or a doggy park. I'm just saying, like, be present. No, Pay attention is the things that you care about, you pay attention to. And so this work, if it matters, if it means something to you, be present, come to the meetings, understand what we're talking about, go to the IFA meetings, see what we're talking about. Like, put yourself in a position to, pro to provide the same amount of care for this process as you would for something that directly impacts you. Because indirectly, this impacts you. And so I really want y'all to just be present. If y'all know recommendations is going to city council, be there to champion us and our conversation. Be there to send letters to the council members and the commissioners and all of the things. Like I sit in meetings all the time and they be like, we got over a thousand emails or we got a petition with 5,000 people. We call for your help, step up. Don't wait in the background to see where the chips fall. Step up. Thank you. In, in, addition to, in addition to stepping up for the individual recommendations that might come forward, that will come forward from the Repar Reparations Commission, my request of you is to participate in the organization of white, of white people. And, and, and do it with this in mind. Do it in mind of how to better yourselves to become allies to the things coming out of the black community. Because what I find are that individually people are willing, but in terms of organizations, they have not quite evolved to the point of paralleling effectively with black people. 
And so the conversations you can have among yourselves probably are best if I'm not sitting there, you see. And so as, and let me give you an example of that that's coming, is that um, it's been eerily silent from the far right, eerily silent. You know, I've not gotten a single hate note. I've only gotten hostile media, media interviews, but that's a bit about the, the extent of it. And my suspicion is that they're waiting for us to finish our work to, they're waiting for us to put it on the table, to take it to the court, just to say that you can't do race-based programs. My question to you, as you organize yourselves within yourselves, is what are you willing to do if the court says no? Now, you know this has to be done in education and healthcare, in criminal justice and housing and economic development. We have specific recommendations here. What are you willing, as white people in this community, dominated by 80% being white, what are you willing to do to affect racial justice in the city? You know, so the, the private sector, who is responsible for much of what we call Jim Crow segregation, the private sector, who is responsible for enslavement, is, 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 is again absent from this. Maybe one of the things you can do in addition to being anticipating the, 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 the countermeasures of the far right, maybe another thing is to hold the private sector accountable for what they did profit from when these areas were actively legal to do. You know, have you noticed the absence of the Chamber of Commerce from these conversations? I mean, when have they been absent when there's profit to be made? Well, how about the profit and justice? Let's participate in that level, even though I know that's not why they're in business. Um, the point being is that there are things you can do that I can't. And I, I advocate that you do those things. Use the power that comes with your position. Thank you. <clears throat> um, CJ, so just, just to add on to the specific ask, uh, specifically work, work with the organization that I work with, the Racial Justice Coalition. Um, we keep people up to date on what's going on and we will keep people informed on opportunities to mobilize. We will be looking into the private sector when the time comes, already ideating it and trying to setting up the chessboard, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I would love to get into a lot more direct action demonstrations against a lot of the culpable private institutions in town. You know, of course, the most obvious would be Biltmore State and places like Grove Park and Chamber of Commerce, and there's a list. But there is an effective uh, way to go at them that I was introduced to um, in, in Atlanta, actually. Like, there's a, whole, there's a whole blueprint of how you approach these entities. You don't come, you know, angry. You come negotiating. Um, but, like I said, that's later on down the road, but a lot of things are being thought about, a lot of things are being planned, and how do you help most to stay proximate to the process and be willing to uh, push back when things disappoint you? Um, and again, go to the, to the RJC website, um, go to the table out there, please sign the pledge. The pledge is what we're trying to do to proactively create uh, political and social capital for our reparations commissioners, because we know that some of the recommendations that will come down will need, uh, if, if electeds are willing to support it, they're gonna need political capital and support from community. So just as much as we organize people to, um, you know, influence our electeds to make different decisions, hopefully you all will also support these electeds if they're willing to make the proper decisions. Um, so just staying proximate to the process, and being willing to take action and continuing the conversations because that's what's gotten us to where we are now. And uh, yeah, just stay, stay in the fight. This isn't something that you know you can say like, okay, it's done now. It's a marathon. That's it. <laughs> it's a long haul. Um, everybody has said pretty much everything. I will say from, uh, Year, years of organizing, grassroots organizing, I will um, say stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And what that means is making sure that you're continuing to educate yourself and not putting that onus on us to educate you. But there's plenty of books, there's plenty of websites, there's the read. I mean, just go ahead, watch YouTube. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that you can do to educate yourself. Um, make sure that you're not talking to just that same black person. 
um, all of us don't think the same. I mean, you've heard it up here. Even where there's similarities, we don't all think the same. Mm -hmm. And so, um, talk to most, multiple of us, right? Have, have conversations, but make sure it's from a place where you're ready to learn and you're not ready to be combative. Um, make sure it's a place that you're willing to sit in your own uncomfortableness. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Um, hearing that you, you may have bought a, a home in Montfort and we want our home back is going to be uncomfortable, right? But being able to understand, um, understand even when we don't agree is going to be very important. Um, making sure that you're having, again, having those conversations with people who look like you. Um, things can be received differently. And also, calling a spade a spade, you can be a lot more um, aggressive in your approach than we can. <laughs> and you, can you, you really can. You can be a lot more aggressive in your approach than we can. Um, and so, like Dewana said, showing up at those meetings, showing up questioning, showing up in numbers, understanding that you don't have to just show up when it's about your neighborhood. You can show up for other things. I always tell people, I'm like, show up like you would for that puppy that's on the side of the road. Um, because people will come out, what we do know about Asheville, people will come out in numbers for animals. And, I, no, yeah, yeah. And I mean, show up in that same way. Um, and then also educate your kids. Educate your kids to understand that black isn't scary. Um, there's nothing to fear about equality. There's nothing to fear about equity. And um, yeah, just, just be ready and willing when we call on you and even if we don't call on you. Oh, no, no, no. You're talking about getting the mascot. <laughs> no, because <laughs> no, I thought about them cat balls. <laughs> thank you. I'll keep giving it to you. You're fine. Like, oh. <laughs> Let us thank this amazing panel. <laughs> yes. Tori has one more thing to say. I left this part out. Um, now this is me talking as RSAA. Also, if you would like to give individually towards reparations, you can go to rsaashville.org and there is a slot there where you can give a one-time um, pledge, you can give every month. There's no amount too small. That is in the YouTube chat. I already put it in the chat. Um, if you go back and watch the live stream, it is in the chat. So um, I want to thank Reverend Tammy Forte Logan as well. And I hope we can continue to, to build community together around this issue, around this need, around this historic invitation to transformation for Asheville and Buncombe County. So we will continue at Grace Covenant to hold you close to our hearts, but we're gonna continue to do more than that. We wanna put our, our bodies where our words are and our resources and our energy and our passion. So I thank you for being here tonight and really helping to, to support a, a true movement. And, um, and we, we could not express our gratitude enough. So um, I pray that everyone has a good night and that you'll take some cookies home and share it with friends and family and neighbors. Um, and that you'll, you'll join us again at Grace Covenant. Our next event in our Summer Racial Justice th Series is on August 13th. And we're going to be exploring the, the 1619 Project and the, the white lash against it and the importance of, of this work for our country learning how to tell the true story of our history. So good night, everyone, and thank you for being here. <laughs>